All right. How's it going, everybody? Welcome to our amphitheater. Come on down, grab a seat. We are just starting up with our artist in town, Kat Burns. She's going to be making a beautiful piece or two pieces of glass for us tonight in our amphitheater hot shop. And welcome to everybody that's joining us online as well. I'm going to introduce the whole team, but Kat Burns is right here in the center, and she's um, just in the midst of kind of looking over a pattern of Marini that we're going to be working with. Chris Giordano is her main assistant. Kat Burns and Chris have been here with us in the amphitheater since Monday morning, producing a lot of work, making some really beautiful things. I'll talk a bit about that. We have G. Brian Juck here. He's going to be helping out. Uh, Bronan Dempsey is going to help. My name is Chris. I'll be jumping in and helping out as well, making some introductions. And Amanda Kranz is our online moderator. So she's kind of fielding any online activity. Probably get a lot of questions um, online as well so we can ask Kat those in real time and see if she has answers for us. But this is an hour and a half segment for our live stream. And this will also be uploaded to our YouTube channel once the final cut is all done. I think that it's Brad that's up there that's going to be doing the camera work for us as well. So we get some great shots of the activity and what's going on. So early on in the week, Kat has produced lots of cane, which are rods of colored glass. She's chopped a lot of those rods up and produced little marini. And that's what we have on this big ceramic plate that we're heating up. We just pulled it out of an oven that was holding it around 900 degrees. And this will turn into a vessel. It's going to turn into a round vessel. Um, but first, they're doing a little cleanup work. It looks like some of those marini might have kind of popped apart. So they're just heating, uh, starting to squeeze and put things back together the way that they need to be. But, and anybody that's here um, in-house with us as well, if you have questions, just shoot your hand right up and I'll, I'll address it as we're working. I'm curious though, anybody here seen glass blowing before? Anybody here seen Blown Away? All right, so Kat is one of the stars of Blown Away season two. If you're not familiar with Blown Away is, Blown Away is a reality TV show about glass blowing. There are two seasons, both available right now on Netflix. And so Kat was part of season two, one of the finalists. I won't give them away any spoilers more than that anyway, if you haven't seen it. But up on our stage, we have lots of furnaces. We have our reheating oven. That's what you're gonna see Chris using quite a bit of for these moves. This is an empty oven. And this is one of the neatest things about our program is the view that you can get from the backside of that furnace. Now that furnace is holding right now around 2,100 Fahrenheit. In the back of it, there's a little port with a window of fused silica. That's a very special type of glass. And it's one of the most common questions we get is how is the camera in that oven? It appears like it because it's such a close up shot, um, but it's right next to that window. And that window has an extremely high melting temperature, that fused silica. In fact, there's even a fan that's blowing on the, the camera to push any residual heat away from it. But it's keeping it safe and sound and allows us to see what's going on here. Our furnace is fueled with natural gas and forced air. And we can turn that up or down. You can see the G is attending to the doors, trying to close them up when they're not using it. It just helps to maintain temperature in that oven. But they're softening this Marini pattern. And one thing when you're working with Marini, especially a pattern this large, is that it takes lots of reheats. You don't want to overheat anything. When you go into that reheating chamber, you all that are seated here, when you look straight on at it, if you think of it as the face of a clock, there are burners, two of them, that are positioned at 10 o'clock, and they're firing downward, so basically on the left side. If he goes in there with that plate and just stays there and gets it really, really hot, the left side of the plate gets really hot, and it starts to soften, and those little marini can kind of puddle out, and you lose the, de the definition in them. So eventually, what you'll probably see us doing is flipping the plate around, multiple times as they heat to kind of balance the temperatures. We might even use a torch to do some spot heating in the middle of the plate. This propane torch could be useful for that. But the name of the game with this is to really get all those marini, and there's literally hundreds of them on there, um, to the same temperature and squeezing them enough so they all kind of tighten up. When she put those marini together on this plate and she prepared this yesterday, here's some examples of a different color marini. They all go together, but then in between all those connections, there's gaps, there's air gaps. Now you wanna minimize that because this is actually gonna get rolled together onto a bubble of glass and she doesn't want there to be too many gaps in between there. So heating and squeezing, um, just kind of taking care of that. She's using some tools called tags or taglias. These are just big metal paddles, kind of like spatulas. Looks like they're getting ready to flip the plate. 
These are Kevlar mittens. Kevlar is a really good material for our glass studio. You can hold on to something very hot with those. And that plate is well over 1,000 degrees now. Lining it up. That's a pretty large pattern, too. We have a much smaller plates that we've been using throughout the day, but that's a pretty large one. Chris, you want a Kevlar glove? I'll grab you one. Chris is wearing a leather glove. Those forks that he's holding on to are going to get pretty hot by the end of this whole process. You're fine. I'm going to scoot right behind you here. So I'll grab him a heftier mitt for that. There you go. Got it. All right. That'll make his life more comfortable. These are white marini. You can start to see now with heat building into them, that orange tint is starting to show up. Good indicator that they are softening. So here is Kat using those paddles to squeeze both sides of that rectangular pattern. She actually did tack fuse these last night. So she laid out this pattern yesterday and she put them into a kiln and heated them up to about 1300 degrees. And that's hot enough to soften the glass just slightly, but stick them all together. And it just kind of gave it a jump start because she knew she only had about an hour and a half for tonight's segment. And she wants to get as much done in that time frame that she can. So she kind of did the steps ahead of time to get us kind of up and running. But if you look on that plate, you can see that rectangular pattern that they're working. And you can also see a circular pattern, which is the same Marini that she's um, used for the first pattern. These are all going to get joined together in the end. And I asked her how this was going to roll out. And she said, first, I'm going to make a bubble of clear glass once I get the pattern situated. I'm going to roll that pattern up onto the exterior of the bubble. And then if you think of it like a cylinder, so there's going to be the tip of the cylinder is not going to have that pattern on there. She's going to use that circle and kind of stamp the end of the cylinder down onto it. So it will join that to the tube that she creates. Do I have that right? What? <laughs> I was just telling them the approach that you told me, that you walked me through. Yep. No, it's cool. I like it. I like it. Now, on this plate, we have put kiln wash. Kiln wash is a really important part of this whole process. Because if you just had a ceramic shelf, a ceramic plate, and you started to heat it up and you were heating the glass like we're doing now with no kiln wash, the marini would stick to the ceramic and you would not get it off. You'd have to break it off once it was cold. That kiln wash is just to resist that's on there um, that helps that to not stick to it. When they do finally roll it up, you'll probably see them brush some of that kiln wash off from the marini. So as we're heating things, if you want to cool the forks in the bottom side of the plate down, you can do that. Cat is using compressed air right now, which just stops the forks from overheating so much. Here's that torch work that I was mentioning, and that's a propane torch. That flame isn't really hot enough to soften the glass per se. Um, it would a little bit, but really what she's doing now is kind of preheating areas when she or when Chris brings the plate back into the reheating chamber now, that area she torched just has a little extra temperature to it. And again, that flipping around. So just working with the one side of that oven getting hotter and hotter, or heating the plate hotter and hotter, flipping it back and forth is very important. I'll jump in here and close the doors down too if you want. you still see, Chris? Okay. Chris can actually see the edges of those marini. When they first came out of the oven, everything was um, relatively rigid still. He can see this, the edges softening a bit in this reheating chamber. We close these doors up a bit when he's in there, and that just helps to bounce the heat back inside the oven and away from Chris as well. Yes. What type of kiln wash are we using here? I don't know what type of kiln wash we're using. I'm not actually sure. Oh, 
Kat has asked for the, these were uh, David Patchen, who is a, a wonderful artist that works with a lot of Marini, brought these, I think it was three years ago now, maybe four years ago, I can't remember. Um, but he was here working with our team in the amphitheater and he brought these with him. These are really nice for big size pieces like this. Not only do they have the length to, I call them samurai swords, not only do they have the length to really accommodate larger patterns, but they also have that wooden guard. So when you're doing that and you're squeezing, your hands are shielded from the heat. Now you could put gloves on too, but it's way cooler to use these samurai sword looking objects. But thank you, David, they are getting some use. Kat made a couple pieces earlier today, uh, same type of form that she'll be creating for us with this piece. They're basically spherical shapes. And when you put the marini on the surface of a piece like this, you can get it really hot and soft and smooth the whole thing out. But if you don't encase it with clear glass and you inflate it, it will still kind of leave some texture behind from the marini. Glass has a memory like that. And that's actually what Kat is after for this series of pieces. She wants them to be tactile really work with that texture. Those quick little moves right there which kind of pokes at the, the patterns is just to make sure that it is not stuck to the plate. Sometimes even with kiln wash on there, if it gets overheated, it will stick. So usually you'll see people kind of give it a quick little tap or a flick or maybe just lift a tool underneath of the pattern. Sometimes we'll do that to see how hot or soft the pattern is, the way that it will move. Looks like G is unclogging a blowpipe. <laughs> yeah. So the, the pipe that I think Kat will be using to make the clear bubble for this pattern, G's just making sure that it is actually not clogged. Depends on what we're doing. Sometimes we use the, the blow pipes for um, a solid handle we call a punty. And sometimes they get clogged. So it's really nice to get that glass out of there beforehand. You'll notice all of you that are in house right now, you can see it. We don't have it on the cameras at the moment, but uh, we have this system attached to the back of the blow pipe. This is a tube that goes to a line of compressed air and there's a foot switch at each bench for this system. This is how we're blowing glass for the time being. And this is simply because of the mask. So normally what we would have done is put our mouth on the mouthpiece and blown through, but we can't do that while we're wearing a mask. So we're using compressed air. You got, you got the air pressure on here. Might just be really clogged. Maybe just try using the actual air gun while you have that in the furnace. I've done that before, it seems to work well. This is a low pressure to inflate the glass. This is set right now to around two PSI. Um, if that pipe is really clogged, that might not be doing the trick. So we're gonna use about 30 pounds of pressure with our other air gun. Let's see if she can get the glass out of there. Cat has a very special pair of calipers on the table here called pie dividers. So these are designed to give you the measurement of the length of a pattern. And if you're gonna roll it up on a bubble like we're about to do, the other side gives you the diameter. So it gives you the circumference and the diameter so you can match the size, the dimensions of the bubble to the length of your pattern. So you can seamlessly roll it up. You got it. Now she's starting to work that smaller pattern, the cap, as we'll call it for the cylinder, the end of the cylinder. Getting some measurements down with that. This is a really lovely tool to have in a glass studio as well. This is our pipe cooler, so when you dip a metal pipe into a furnace and collect glass. This furnace is held right now at 2,100 Fahrenheit. The pipe does heat up, obviously. Now, 
normally we can hold on to at least half or two thirds of the pipe because of the stainless steel they're made from is not a very good conductor for metal. It does conduct though, so if we want to make our lives easier and more comfortable, we can just bring the pipe over here, set it in this water trough, nice little foot pump, and it cools things off for us. But G is starting the bubble for the, the main body of this vessel. That pattern will get wrapped onto. He's got a couple gathers of our clear glass, and it does look orange when it comes out because it's glowing. That's the infrared heat that we're seeing. But he's taking a seat at the other bench. He's going to shape. He's going to center this using a tool called a block. This is a fruit wood scoop that's been soaked in water. These are cherry wood, but fruit woods are nice and clean when they burn with a low resin content. That's why we like them. They also burn out very evenly. So there's a tight, even grain structure. As the tool does slowly burn, it continues to keep that nice curvature so we can nicely shape the glass with it. You'll see the team use this item too, which a lot of people get quite a kick out of it when we tell them it's newspaper, folded up wet newspaper. There's a lot of layers to this, and this one's brand new. They just burned this one in today. Uh, so this will be around for about a week or two. But it's very well insulated because there's enough sheets put together, and it is also soaked in water. Another question? Yep. Is there any difference between the control you have blowing glass with your mouth or the compressed air? Is there any difference with the control we have blowing glass the normal way with our mouth or using a compressed air system? Absolutely. This system was really well designed. You can see on the back of the bench here, there's our air pressure regulator. We can dial that up or down to pounds of pressure. And then there's a needle valve right here, which gives it tiny, tiny adjustments. So this system, you can dial it up or down with a lot of control. But the big difference between this system and blowing with our mouth, it's kind of hard to adjust that on the fly. When you're blowing through your mouth, you can change the pressure instantaneously. You can blow harder. You can blow softer. Uh, you can even just give a quick little blast of air when you want to. If you don't have this attached, you're going to have to attach it and put the pedal and whatnot. But the one thing that I really miss about being able to blow with our mouth is you have bio relay when you do that. You can feel how soft the glass is or you can feel how stiff the glass is when you're blowing with your mouth. You can use that bio relay as you know, basically a reference. The compressed air doesn't care one way or another. It's set to where it is and it's just going to do its thing. Um, it, it works really well. We are very happy that we have it in place. It has allowed us to continue doing what we're doing through the, the times. Um, but it is very, very different for sure. That being said, a lot of people ask us, will you continue to use it when you no longer need to wear the mask? Are you going to keep it in place? Are you going to get rid of it? What's going to happen with it? It's already made, so there's no, to get, no need to get rid of it. And we actually do like it for certain things. At times, you can stay at the bench, turn the pipe with your left hand, shape the glass with your right hand, and now inflate with your foot. Before that, you'd either have an assistant come over and help you with that, or you'd set the tool down with your right hand, put the pipe in both hands, and then, you know, give it a little blow as you're going through. But it has been uh, very efficient for certain things, and our team has grown to like it for certain things. But I think we're all looking forward to when it's just an option and not a requirement. So G's got a third gather on top of that bubble that he made. He did make a little starter bubble inside that. Nice, even gather. He makes this look pretty easy. G's been blowing glass for about 21 years now full time. Just keep that in mind. Lots of skill, lots of control, lots of muscle memory, too, at this point. When you watch a glass blower turning so smoothly, that is muscle memory. It does take a while to really develop that. Does anybody here have any questions about anything? About Cat's Week with us? Yeah. Wait, say that again? Oh, yeah, it looks sooty. Yep. So he's asked, when we use the propane torch and they're torching the white glass, why does it turn all black? Why does it look sooty? That is reducing the color. So that's raw, white colored glass that's on there. And that propane torch creates a reduction on it. So it reduces it and makes it kind of look dirty. When they go into this reheating furnace, there's air mixed in with natural gas. So it's much, much cleaner. It's not a reduction environment. And that reduction burns away. So it's totally OK. If we made this piece and we're all done with it and we're about to put it into a kiln that slowly cools it and she uses that torch, that reduction could stay there. So I don't think that she'll probably use that uh, towards the end, but that's just reduction. Sometimes we use that on purpose. There are colors that are designed to reduce really well. We don't have one of your pumpkins out here, do we? 
So for certain effects, we can use reduction, and there are colors that are designed to reduce and turn iridescent. I'm going to show you one of Kat's really cool pumpkins. So early on in the week, uh, we were kind of in heavy production mode down here, working on lots of different things in Kat's product line, and this is one of the notorious uh, Unity pumpkins. So the color in the stem, I think this is a blue. Is this like a silver blue that you guys add to this? Iris violet. So when you hear iris tagged on to a color, I'll talk a bit more about the colors in a moment, but that refers to a reduction color. So you can see they use that same propane torch at the end when this stem was already shaped, blasted it with the propane, and instead of the violet color, you get this really cool kind of metallic sheen to it, and that's reduction. The white isn't really designed to be reduced nicely, and that's why it looks kind of sooty and dirty, but that reduction burns away. So the colors, there's a lot of different ways to work with color, and there are several companies that produce it. Much of what we work here at the museum comes from a German company called Reichenbach. They've been in the business for over a couple hundred years now, so they have two centuries of know-how when it comes to creating those colors. When you mix the raw ingredients together to make glass, can anybody tell me the main ingredient to glass? Just shout it out if you know it. Sand, thank you, thanks for that, thanks for playing along. Silica sand, soda ash and limestone, different metals, oxides, different metal chlorides and different metal oxides change the colors. So there's over a couple hundred different color choices nowadays, we're pretty fortunate. So Kat's taken, I think, the final gather for this. She says yes, that is the final gather. We have to build glass in separate layers. Again, we call those gathers because of the viscosity when it's held at 2,100 degrees. It's a lot like honey. So you can dip in and you can collect a good amount if you know how to turn really smoothly, but you're limited to how much you can gather at one time. So to make a larger scale piece, you have to build it up in multiple layers. In between those gathers, you have to let that core kind of stabilize. You have to let it cool a little bit. And cool is relative. That just means rigid or stiff. Someone's wondering what brings Kat to the museum this week? What brings Kat to the museum this week? Well, Kat is actually local. She lives here in Corning. She's been blowing glass in Corning for quite some time. This particular week is a very special week, though. It's a partnership with our shops. So the marketplace here, um, located bottom floor of our museum, this is a partnership where Kat has been allowed to come into the amphitheater and work with our team, work with our studio, and uh, create some of her product line. So some of that has been producing things that are going literally directly into the market after they come out of the oven um, once she signs them. Another part is a little bit of experimentation. So she's been kind of prototyping and playing around with some ideas that she's had. And this is just a special uh, live stream show. Not just, but this is a live stream show. So this is um, for fun for her and really kind of exper and experimenting with some of those pieces that she's been creating throughout the week. You'll see her use this marvering table. That's just a big steel table. Checking those caliper measurements yet again. Getting the cylindrical shape so it matches up the pattern. When you go to roll this pattern up, this is a one-shot deal. This is one of those moments in glass where you got to be really certain of your measurements and everything. As soon as you come over with that cylinder and touch it down to this plate of Marini, hot glass sticks to hot glass. So you're committed to whatever setup work you've done. You need me or Gio? Oh, there's two Chris's down here right now. So Kat just said, this is the one, she's ready. Gio takes another heat on the plate. This is where it's nice to have two separate workstations. The oven that Kat's at is a little bit of a smaller one. I don't even know if we'd be able to fit that plate that he has in this smaller one, but large enough for the bubble that Kat has. All right, so this will probably happen right at the bench where he's been laying that plate down. Maybe we'll get a good overhead shot of this. You can see how Gio kind of tests the corners of the pattern with the tag, kind of lifts it up. He can see how the, the glass is bending and moving. Looks like it's got a really good heat. She tags it down and just gently rolls. She's inflating the bubble a little bit more right now before she goes all the way. She doesn't want it to overlap, so she's expanding the bubble. That gives her a little bit more diameter to work with on the gather. 
and just gently back and forth until she has the pattern completed on both sides. Nice job. I think that deserves a big round of applause. That was very well executed and nicely coordinated amongst the team. Beautiful. Need another door over here? You got it. You want the medium door? There you go. You all right like that? Do you want them to keep that plate out then? Yeah. They, she's going to pick that up pretty soon, she said. Sure. Gotcha. So this is kind of like buttoning up a shirt. You want to make sure that everything is aligned up, and she's just doing that with some tweezers. That was beautiful, Kat. Nicely done. Sure, of course. You're on. You got it. Do you need a brush or anything? There's a brush right here. So if there is any residual kiln wash on the pattern that she's just rolled up, we can brush that off now. Looks like it's pretty clean, but you never know. I'm going to go through the motions now. I like doing this part. I'm a bit of a clean freak. We're gonna sandblast it anyway. Oh, okay. Cat said so she's going to sandblast this after the fact, so it'll give it kind of an etched texture. But it's always good to just give it a little brush off. So Chris has kind of been in a holding pattern with that little disc shape of Marini that'll go on to the end of this bubble that Cat has. Michael has the dimensions set for her, so she knows what to shoot for here. This is a really good use of that Marv ring table, just a big steel slab. So when you watch a team working like this, you only know, have one, two, three, four, five, six members out here on the team. Me, Cat, <laughs> Cat is the what we what we call what we call the gaffer. It's <laughs> a name confusion here. Uh, Cat's the gaffer. Gaffer is a term that we like to use for the one that's leading the team. Now you can have 20 people working together if you want. You really need to have one person that's gaffing. So it's kind of like an orchestra, right? You have one conductor that keeps all the rhythm, keeps all the instruments really working together to create a beautiful melody. Same thing for a piece of glass. But you can see even the eye contact, right? So Chris, Gio, we call him uh, Gio, because Chris Giordano, um, kind of looking over at this side of the stage to see when he needs to reheat, when he needs to be ready with that pattern. Timing is of the essence when you're working glass, temperature and timing. So here we go. Michael's got the pipe. Looks like Cat will kind of guide him on to the tip. Again, this is one of those one-shot deals. Plunging it down. Looks like a pretty good shot. Let's give him another round of applause. Uh, that, nicely done. Nicely done. That's where you don't want to flinch. This is Michael B. Michael has joined us as well. Michael was working on a different stage, doing demonstrations all day today, and he's coming to the amphitheater for the action here tonight. Very cool. A little more brush action. So this particular form, right now we're still in the, in the relatively early stages of a vessel, and she could literally turn this into any shape vessel she wanted to. The pieces she made earlier were spherical shapes, and I think that's what she's going for with this one as well. So once we get everything kind of situated and melted together nicely, we can start to work some good heat into the whole thing, start to inflate it larger and larger. And she's got a decent amount of clear glass on the inside, so she can stretch that quite a ways. Now, when you start to inflate and stretch this, those marini will also stretch. So all those little kind of polka dots from those individual rods that went in to make the marini will also stretch with this. 
But remember, she said she's after that tactile feeling, so she wants to retain that texture. Um, basically, so if somebody were to check this piece out and they were visually impaired, they can actually kind of feel the texture with their hands and experience it in a different manner, which I think is really cool. All about the experience. Does anybody else here have any questions? Okay, let me think any. They're just so in awe. People ask us about the system we have in place for this reheating oven and the rollers and why we put our foot on that and kind of push it forward and pull it back. That just changes the fulcrum point. So when we're, especially for heavier pieces of glass and you set that pipe down in the rollers and you want to push that into the oven, you can push the rollers forward with your foot and that just changes the leverage. It gives you a little bit more leverage. And the same when you want to exit that oven, you kind of pull back with those uh, foot pads and bring a little bit closer to you. As she heats, too, another question we get quite a bit is how do you know when to heat? How do you know how long to stay in those ovens to get the glass just the right temperature? Um, most of it comes down to experience. You know, Kat's been blowing glass for, you said 11 years now, Kat? Yep, 11 years. So that's a lot of experience. We can also feel the glass softening as we're in those ovens. So the longer you stay in there, the more gravity's pull kind of feels on it. If you were to stop turning, the glass would slump. Now, the hotter it is, the faster it slumps. But you can really feel in the torque that you have to apply with your hands and your fingers when the glass is getting hotter and hotter. Furthermore, you can feel when it's getting colder, too, or stiffer. It becomes easier to, to, to turn those blowpipes. So we really do rely on all that dexterity. She's doing a little cleanup work on the bench here. This is a really nice thing to do, especially you know when you watch somebody working and they've used all those different tools, you know they're not gonna need those tools again. It's nice to kind of clean them out of the way so when she sits at the bench and wants to grab the paper or the jacks, which I'll talk about in a moment, she doesn't have a pile of tools to kind of dig through and sort through. By heating and rolling on this table, this is called a marver, so we call this marvering. When she's doing this, it's really kind of taking that outside edge and kind of squeezing it a little bit more, but it's also working some of that heat back into that pretty massive gather that's on the inside of the pattern. Sometimes it doesn't look like much is really taking place. You're like, why is she heating and turning again? Why is she heating and rolling again? But really it's kind of building the heat into the glass, getting the heat distributed just the way you need it. Yes? How much does that wad of glass weigh? I'm gonna guess the amount of glass that she has there is probably what, 12 pounds, roughly? It's kinda hard to say exactly, but I would guess probably about 12 pounds of glass that she has. The blowpipe that she's working with, that's a little bit of a larger one than the standard pipes we have out here. So that pipe she has might be about 15 pounds. Roughly. This one's about, I think, maybe 10, 11 pounds of glass, or 10, 11 pounds of metal. But it's also, you know, you can't grab all the way down. We talked about that. So you're sort of holding it back. So it feels like the weight is a little bit more when you're doing that. But I can't stress enough the hardest thing, one of the hardest things, is the turning. So the more fluid the glass becomes from heating, that torque that you have to apply with 12 pounds of glass becomes quite significant. And that's, I think, where the glass blowers really kind of take the most wear and tear is your hands, your wrists, and your forearms. You know, not just carpal tunnel, um, but tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, all that from like just this constant activity. That's a, that's a pretty big one, a pretty common one. Physical therapists, chiropractors, they love glass blowers. We bring a lot of business their way. Even this move, you know, this marvering, it looks like, oh, she just kind of sets it down and then pushes the pipe. That is, that is not true. This is, in itself is pretty hard to do because if you just set that piece down for the briefest of moments without turning very smoothly and supporting the weight, you create a flat spot on that glass. If you create a flat spot, it's extremely hard to get rid of that flat spot. So when you're marvering, it's kind of like a smooth landing, but you're also kind of lifting up. You're supporting the weight of that gather. You're simply using the metal surface as a tool to kind of shape against. You're not just laying the glass on there. No, I'm just 
is there a name for the type of glass that goes on after your first gather? Well, the first, the first bubble that G made, everybody who was here saw G make a couple gathers, and then he made a nice little core bubble. A lot of glass blowers call that a starter bubble or a core bubble. Um, it can also be called a parison. That's just kind of a foundation to build on. But a gather of glass on top of that is simply just called a gather. So when we get it out of the furnace, it's called a gather. Brad, if it's you up there, Brad, can you roll that animation, that gathering animation? I meant to ask for this earlier. Thank you very much. If you take a look at the screens right now, this shows what it looks like when we gather glass from this furnace. There's many different types of furnaces. What we have is a crucible sitting inside of ours. Uh, some ovens are a day tank, so they're kind of like a brick uh, square or rectangle shape. But this is a ceramic pot. This one can hold 1,000 pounds of glass if we fill it. It's pretty full today. Michael and I threw a couple hundred pounds of glass inside of it last night. And what we shovel in there is called cullet. There are chunks of glass that's already been pre-made, and this is one piece of that cullet. So we buy this in bags. It comes in 50-pound bags. We get a pallet of it. Um, you can shovel this right into that furnace, and a hundred, couple hundred pounds melts down in a couple hours. And then overnight, it kind of finds out and cleans up and turns into really good usable glass. But you could mix the raw ingredients. A lot of places do, the silica sand, the soda ash, and limestone. Uh, but we like to call it here because it's really clean. There's dust free. You don't have to worry about mixing. Um, and shoveling all the silica dust into that oven. And the cullet, the glass, when it's already been melted, has gone through the process of converting to glass. So there's a lot of energy that goes into making it into glass for the first time from the silica. A lot of time, too. So once it's already gone through that process, it's much, much quicker, a lot easier, and easier to handle, really, I think. So cooling the pipe, after all that reheating and shaping, cooling the pipe down, that just gives us a little bit more control, a little more comfort. Really cool. So you can kind of see the Marini. They're not all the same size dots of white either. So when Kat prepared this Marini, there were different size rods. There were smaller size rods sort of all stuck together. And it's really showing through now that that pattern has been melted down really well. So with different colors, um, I'm going to interpret the question a little bit. Different colors in glass have different stiffness to them or softness. When you're talking to glass blowers, we'll say this is a really soft color or this one's really stiff. What that means for us is that as we're heating something, softer colors start to move around quickly. Stiffer colors take much longer in that oven to move around. So if you start mixing soft and stiff colors together in a form, you might imagine that can cause you some problems, can cause you some technical difficulties. So as you're working with something, you really just have to pay attention to that. Now, this piece, I think this is all white with some clear glass intermixed in the Marini. Um, but this is pretty uniform in temperature, so she's not going to struggle so much with that. But if you see a piece that has like black and white stripes all throughout it, black is notoriously soft. White is notoriously stiff. So if you see a nice thin piece of the beautiful shape that's uh, you know, just nice and symmetrical, and it's black and white. The person that made it had some pretty good know-how of how to work with those colors. But I want to bring the attention back to what the team's doing. This is where things get really involved and really exciting with multiple people jumping in there. Kat is still the gaffer, seat, seated at the bench, using a newspaper pad to kind of stop the bubble from blowing out as she hits the foot pedal. Chris is really doing a lot of the turning here, a lot of the torque. G is also providing some shielding using those wooden boards just to get in there uh, in between Kat's arm and that object because it's radiating a lot of temperature, a lot of heat. Soon you will see them start a constriction. I talked about the tool. I didn't show you. Jacks. She's heating the jack blades right now. The blades of the jacks aren't very sharp. They're kind of like butter knives in profile. but. We heat and put beeswax on them. That's what she's doing there. She's swiping them through some beeswax. That's a lubrication. So when she starts to use the blades and squeeze over the bubble, the wax will stop the blades from binding up, from sticking. If they're just dry metal, nothing on there, they kind of grab the glass. They don't work so smoothly. But we'll squeeze a jack line or a constriction line into the form to make sure we have a breakoff point, a removal point. This is really, this is critical to the process. I'm going to jump in here and blow some. Oh, I was going to get the smoke out of her face, but I'm going to shield her hand right now, too. 
So Kat just said, you want to do a little small hang so this is easier. She meant dip the bubble out of the ground and use a little bit of gravity. So it's a little bit easier when you're squeezing a jack line in to have the bubble hanging to the ground and using gravity. It's easier for Chris and G right now to turn, is what I meant to say. She is inflating a little bit more. Using this propane torch to preheat certain areas before another reheat. If she sees the bubble isn't blowing out in one area, and we call that the backside of the bubble right now, she's using that torch to heat that area, allowing the front half of the bubble to kind of cool a bit. So this is giving a little bit more heat and softness in that area. So when they go to kind of work the jack line down more or blow it up more, that area is going to move around as well. Temperature control. Kat just said, last heat. <laughs> last big heat, she said. So do you have room in the annealer right now? Those plate is it the... <laughs> Let's double check. We've used a lot of ovens. We used uh, two ovens today. Oh, there's room. There's room on the left side. We'll be fine. Well, all it would have meant was moving that plate out of the way, but we're, we're, we're fine. We don't have to adjust anything. All right. That's one thing with the newer paper pads is they are pretty smoky until they get burned in. I'll just blow some of the smoke away from the team here. That's a great shot right there. Lots of smoke, lots of ash. Yeah, let's give it up for the team. That was really, really well done. Lots of action happening. She is continuing to inflate. Just tapping that foot pedal when she wants more air pressure. That is beautiful. Yeah, to make a nice round sphere like that really does require having good even heat throughout the whole thing. Again, it looks like it just kind of happens that way when the team's doing it, but that's far from the point, or far from the case. I think she's going to work that constriction down a bit tighter. The tighter that constriction line is when we go to break something free, the easier it will be to break free without damaging the form. So we're going to crack the glass, so you don't want the crack to travel. So we really kind of carve that constriction in nicely. This is where you have to really pick up the torque with the blowpipe. That tool does act like a brake, even though it's got the beeswax on there. It does kind of slow the, or makes the turn a little bit harder. It's beautiful. What do you all think of this piece? Fantastic, right? Absolutely beautiful. So I think they've got the, the form where they want it. Now it's time to kind of let certain areas cool so they stiffen up and stay in place. But take a series of quick reheats called flash heats. Brona, you want to run this side? Just balancing temperatures, really. And then we'll... Get this piece off the pipe and into the annealing oven. To anneal a piece like this, even though it's rather large, 12 hours is probably fine. We'll ask Kat what she wants, but 12 hours should be plenty. The time frame to slowly cool something, the annealing cycle, is really dependent on how thick a piece of glass is, not how large. And this isn't very thick. She's blowing it up pretty, pretty thin, relatively thin. That's an oxygen gas torch. We call that the hot torch because that flame can get close to 4,000 degrees. And that really just liquefies the glass pretty quickly. Beautiful. So G's gonna gear up. He'll get some, uh, probably a long sleeve shirt on to cover his, his arms, but he'll put some Kevlar mittens on and most likely a face shield so he can kind of hug this piece get it off the pipe and into the annealing oven. Are you going to fire polish this one too? You going to fire polish this break off too? Yeah. yeah, okay, great. Yep. Chris said one more flash. And a flash is just that very brief reheat, just a maintenance heat. 
make sure the temperatures are where they need to be. Learning those temperatures, that's something that also comes with experience. Obviously, we're not looking at it with our eyes and telling you exactly how hot it is. Um, but the annealing does start at 900 degrees for this type of glass. So that's where our annealers are set. And they are programmed, when we start the program, to slowly cool down over whatever time we need it to. And this, again, probably 12 hours. So it is moving slightly, but it's moving on that constriction, which is a pretty good thing. When it's moving like that, we know that it's in a good temperature range. And you can shock that line that is still moving with a little water on a diamond file. You can score the glass. She might apply a little more water to it. And what water does at this stage is creates little stress fractures. But she will fire polish that break off with a hot torch right before we put this one away. Here's the water. We're really careful when we do this move not to let water touch the actual piece. One little drop could definitely ruin it. But you see how G is cradling uh, right below it. Just in case it pops off, he's got his gloves there, ready in case. And I've seen pieces drop at this point before, so it's always a really nice thing to do. Yep, I gotcha. Breaks free. Quick little zap with our torch. I love that shot, the flame going into the sphere. You can see how it just lights the globe right up. Safe and sound, G will get it into the annealer. We'll make sure it gets loaded well. Nice low, G. Let's give it up for the team. That's Cat Burns. Beautiful job. Chris Giordano, got Bronan Dempsey, G. Brian Juck, lots of work, and Amanda Kranz. Okay, so I'm going to hop off the mic, get a little bit of water. I think we are going to roll right into the next piece. It looks like Kat still has some time. Um, can I answer any questions before we do, though? Yes, over here. That piece should be out and ready tomorrow, but it might not be out while we're open because we're going to turn that kiln off around 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. So it won't be out in time for uh, opening hours the day after that. But I'd say the best thing to do if you want to see any cat's work, that included, is check her out on social media. She has a great Instagram account. I think it's uh, written on the board over there, but it's Cat Burns Glass on Instagram. She does a lot of work, a lot of video work on TikTok, and she um, usually links those videos to her Instagram. So she said that that's really the, the most accessible way to see some stuff. So do check her out there. Oh, and these pieces will all be for sale as well. Okay, so this piece is going to go into the marketplace for sale. Um, so you can even be the one that owns it, maybe. Any other questions? Okay, hang tight, stick around. We're going to do a little um, group chat here, make sure that we're on the same page for the next piece. I think the next piece is going to be very similar, but a different color pattern. Um, so I'll tune in with them and see. And I think I'll probably hand the mic off and have somebody else narrate the second portion. But thanks for joining us. Let's give the team another big round of applause. Beautiful effort. Excellent job, Kat. All right. Welcome back. We're going to start up another piece here. And my name is Brona, and I'm going to be narrating this second piece for you guys, for Kat. And Chris is just going to be helping out. So if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. So they're heating up the plate again with a different Marini pickup now. This one has a bunch of different colors on it. And G and Chris over here are preparing that bubble that a cat's going to pick this piece up on. So she's just making sure everything is straight and starting to do a little bit of the squeezing process. Now, both of these pickups today were preheated and fused together, but we need to get them warm enough to have them picked up on the bubble. And we went to the same school together. Yeah, and we went to the same school together. <laughs> 
If you don't know, Kat's a graduate of Salem Community College, and that's where I went as well. Pretty cool place. My talk. Oh, you're good. You're good. It'll be fixed later. All right, so she's just using a fluffy torch again. This one runs only on propane to give a nice heat to that pickup. And we're just doing a bunch of quick flashes again and again to be able to have this hot enough. And they just dropped a little bit of color on this bubble. So the last one was all clear, but he just heated up a little solid bar of color. So it looks like this, but you won't believe these colors. Some of them can be pretty dense. So this one right here is actually like a transparent green, but in this high of concentrate, it kind of just looks like black. So all these different colors or all these are different colors, but they look the same in the bar form. And once we begin to drop them over clear glass and then continue to inflate and inflate and inflate, they become more transparent as they are like basically diluted. So when we do an overlay like that, we just rolled it back over that bubble and he'll continue to gather over that layer of color to create the size that we need for this pickup. Now you'll see them soon, they'll start to do checks with uh, pie dividers to know how big the bubble has to be for this pickup. And Kat's just putting on some Kevlar gloves right now. They're pretty heat resistant, so they allow us to pick up things. And this uh, is also what firefighters use, so yeah. What color is that? I don't know, G, what color is that? Say that again. Evening red in German. The, the name is German, so I'm not going to try to butcher that. But. but yeah, you can even see it now. And also another thing about uh, colored glass is that, we'll, it, that it will be a different color when it is done through the annealing process. So right now isn't really a true statement of the color it's going to be. Actually, some red colors don't look very pretty when they're hot. So they're just checking on these pie dividers here. So you'll see that there's like a longer rectangle and then there's the circle, which will be the top of the bubble. If you think about it like a long vase, that longer portion is gonna be the sidewalls and then that bottom piece is going to be the bottom, but it will all become one large bubble and it'll look more cohesive that way. And she's just using some compressed air to cool down that metal fork. You can see, it's hard to see the underneath of it, but it gets kind of red hot, and so we don't want it to start to warp with all this heating and cooling. So it looks like G over here has gathered another layer of clear over that color overlay. We'll probably do at least one more before we're ready. This is a relatively large piece, so we need a lot of glass to be able to continue to work it. She's just pressing them together with the like samurai swords. <sighs> Very deadly. We also want to keep on opening and closing these doors. We don't want the reheating chamber to have to work too hard to keep everything thoroughly heated. If we left those doors open, it would be losing a lot of heat. And we want this glass to be warm enough again to pick up.
she's just hitting them almost a little bit to know that they still move. So that's a ceramic plate that's been covered in kiln wash. And we just want to make sure that the glass isn't sticking to the plate or else we won't be able to get it off at all. If we heat it too hot, it will fuse to that plate. And if you're watching G. Brian over here, he just gathered another layer of glass. How many layers of glass do you think you're going to get? Just one more and then we're ready. But this is already a lot of glass. So there's a very, very small bubble inside of there. He's almost done zero inflation since doing that drop of color on there. So it's mostly clear, so you'll really see how long that color bar will go and how much color will actually produce. Just checking on these pie dividers. So these pie dividers will tell us the width of the bubble to the correct dimensions of the pickup. So they're called pie dividers. It's the rule of thirds. So break it up into thirds. And a third of that pickup is the third of the size of the bubble, basically. Also just checking the length to make sure that it's long enough as well. He's just doing some shaping and centering over here, actually using a pad of newspaper that's been soaked in water. This is a very commonly used uh, tool in the glass making. It's one of the closest things that we can get to touching the glass with our hands. So they're going to take the final gather here soon. And then we'll be ready to do this pickup. So it's just a, a whole thing with a, the timing to make sure everything's hot enough and everything's the correct size. She's just going to use this pipe cooler right here to make sure this pipe is cold enough to touch. Uh, the stainless steel that we use is a very poor conductor of heat, so it doesn't take to, it takes a long time for it to get warm enough, but with continuous heating in the reheating chamber, that heat slowly moves up the pipe. So we want to make sure it's cold enough and we just cool it down with water. So that's what all that steam coming off was. So Kat's going to do the final gather, and she's actually going to do what's called a strip gather. So she'll be taking away some of that unwanted material so she doesn't have too much glass. So you'll see just a bunch of glass drip off into that bucket right there. Or not, maybe not. <laughs> or she will, yeah. So she just made sure that it was the right size and then took off on it and in un necessary glass. So she almost has the size that she needs. She's just going to make sure everything is a consistent heat throughout. So that last layer that we added is a lot hotter than the core, since we had to cool down that core a little bit before being able to gather this much glass. Now, the glass at this temperature, 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, is like the consistency of honey. So it's hard to gather up that much material and mass all at once. So that's why we do it in a bunch of layers like this.
just doing a check and a couple rolls on the marver to make sure it's just the right size. So right now, you can see a little hose that just got detached from the end, and we'll be reattached over there once we're ready to do this pickup. So since we have the masks on, we are not able to blow glass traditionally, so we've come up with this new system. So anytime you see inflation happening, it's happening with compressed air. This system runs about two PSI, so that's why they have that little foot pedal out there. So they will attach a boot to the end, which has a hose on it, and everything's linked together. So that's how she'll inflate if she needs to. Just final heat to make sure everything is warm enough. We want it to have a little bit of a glow so that it tacks together. Now she's just putting that compressed air boot on in case she needs to inflate. He's just rolling up all those little pieces of Marini right now. And now she's just inflating her bubble a little bit to match the size of the Marini. Slowly just pressing it down. And now you're just taking uh, tweezers and compressing everything, and then they'll actually sweep away any of that kiln wash that was left behind. So that kiln wash will come off now, but if it gets too hot, it will just fuse to the surface and leave an undesirable texture. So this piece is kind of heavy, so Kat will alternate between who's actually doing the lifting and turning. And they're just going to use some tweezers to connect everything together and push it all down. And you'll notice that we never stop rotating our glass. This is to keep everything on center. So you're seeing right now what happens when we stop rotating and when we have to do these specific points, the glass is just immediately falling off center. And she's just using the tweezers to try to just squish all that pattern together. If you want a look closer look at what the Marini starts off like, it's all down here. So it would start with the bar, and then we would pull it into what's called cane. So these little tubes, and then we would put a bundle of these tubes together, pick them up, and pull them in the same process. And then we have a bunch of little canes inside of a larger cane. And then we cut them up into little discs, and they end up like this. And then once they all get put on a plate, and then they can be heat up and fused together. And over here, they're just making sure that that top cap will fit this bubble and form. They measured it all out beforehand, but once we begin to inflate and actually attach all that Marini, it might shift and change. So we use a bunch of calipers to make sure everything's the correct size so that they don't melt or get um, messed up in any way. So she's just also rolling the sidewalls of this form on the metal table right here. It's called a marver. Just wiping away some of the kiln residue that gets left behind sometimes as she's doing the shaping. So 
she's actually right now just telling G when to inflate. So he steps on the foot puddle and it starts to inflate. And this is the great thing about this new system is it doesn't require someone being at the end of the pipe to start to inflate. So it's kind of nice for these moments right here when you don't necessarily have the capability to be rolling it on the marver and inflating it at the same time. She's just doing a price check to make sure everything's going to properly fit together. And right now it looks like a bunch of separate forms, but as everything starts to melt into one piece, you won't really be able to tell the difference. So just more inflation and uh, pushing it up against the marber. This is just trying to force that bubble to come past the marini that she picked up. So when she started off with that roll up, the bubble wasn't really long enough. So that's what the move is when she's rolling and inflating. She's trying to force that bubble to be long enough to do this next pickup. So it looks like there has been a change in plans. So we kind of have to roll on the fly here. If the glass doesn't go according to plan, we have a general idea of what we're going to do. But if we have to change it along the way, we do that. So she's no longer able to put that cap on like she did the last one. So she's going to do something different to it. It's not the right diameter. It would cover up a, a weird amount of glass. So she's going to put it somewhere else instead. Uh, I'm not quite sure yet but we will figure it out. So it's going back in the kiln for now. The cap was supposed to be at this point, but I think she's gonna do a little bit more inflation and shaping before she attaches it to a different part of it so that it'll be more of a tactile piece. And all of our pieces that involve Marini are a little bit tactile because they don't fully fuse together. And that's kind of the point of using this type of medium. So when we start with just a bunch of little discs like this, you have to do a lot of working and a lot of shaping to get everything to not have a bunch of texture on it, to get it hot enough to mash together. And sometimes you can lose a little bit of the form or warp your uh, pattern altogether. So she just got it really, really hot and is going to start to do the shaping. So you can see that more at this point, the marini has basically become one with the bubble. And if you look very closely at that center portion of the bubble where there is no marini yet, you can kind of see this veil of color and how translucent it's become with the inflation process. It's kind of hard to see because of all the marini on the inside. And while 
while she's doing all the heating, you can see that um, Chris and G are kind of switching up the bench so she has whatever she needs right in front of her to begin the shaping. So she's just creating a little constriction at the top portion of that bubble where there's no texture um, to be able to cut that off as we don't really need that anymore. And the tools that she's using right now are jacks. Jacks are the most often used tool in the glass studio. Uh, and they are actually coated in beeswax. So anytime you see flames or steam come up, that's what's happening. She's trimming it away with the diamond shears. And the glass at this temperature is pretty easy to cut through. So now it's completely textured in that marini, and you can't really see the color on the inside. She's just shaping it now with a pad of newspaper again. So in the very beginning, you saw us using more block, is what they're called. These are made out of cherry wood, and they're also for shaping. And the newspaper is just a better shaping tool at this point, as it doesn't have the predefined shape that the block does. So any specific area that she needs to have cooled while she's inflating, she can do that with the confine of her hand and that shape of the newspaper. And they're actually pulling out that um, kiln shelf right now, so it doesn't look like we're going to be adding anything else to it. We just needed more space in the kiln with it being removed. So there's a couple larger pieces in that kiln, and we like to preheat that uh, plate with all of the little chips of marini on it. It can't really all be done in this reheating chamber or else it could cause it to start breaking and those marini chips could start popping off because they're not fully sealed together. So by putting it in the kiln for 10 or so minutes before we actually pick it up, it allows for us to make sure that everything is fully fused together and uh, up to a workable hot temperature. So she's just pulling a little bit better of a termination right now is what it's called. So the termination is whatever's left behind when you remove some glass. We want it to be as clean and on center as possible. And so she's just creating a little bit of stress and then snapping that off with the same tool. Now, traditionally, there would be a little bucket under there to catch all of those trimmings or runoffs or whatever. But because Kat needs to also stand on the outside of the bench, it just goes into the little tray in front of you, which traditionally would be there. This is going to get cold right now. We're going to batudo it. Batudo it? Yeah, we're, we're like not where it was, how it was supposed to be. We're going to fire texture into it. Okay. So since it did go according to plan. She has come up with a plan for after it is all cold through the annealing cycle and off the pipe. So she's going to patudo it and add some texture through cold working processes. So we can cold work glass, and that's a pretty common way of working glass as well. You might have seen a lot of it with uh, crystal work. So the carving into it is a cold working process. So we use diamond encrusted um, different tools and bits. So she might patuto it with a large lathe that has wheels that are encrusted with diamonds to get that carved line in there. And when you see carved glass like that, most oftenly it is a crystal. And the difference between a crystal and what we're melting here is lead. So it's lead crystal that they're talking about. And that lead makes it easier for them to carve into it. But it's not really necessary for us here, and so we don't use it. And that's why we use soda lime glass when melting in the furnace. So she's starting to inflate it further to try to get the final form at this point.
You might also notice that Kat isn't really doing a lot of the rotation and heavy lifting, and that's why we have a multitude of assistants. It's a really, really heavy piece uh, and a really, really heavy pipe as well. So for her to do all of that work uh, would be a little difficult. So by having the weight shared across a great number of people, it makes it a lot easier. She's just heating up her jacks right now as well to put more beeswax on them. And that's what she's swiping through on the corner right there. We want to continue to coat those jacks in beeswax so that they don't make a really horrible scratching sound. That's what the indication is that you need to re-swipe through your wax. All right, so you can see that it's almost glowing like a bright orange color right now. It has a good amount of heat, and you can even see the heat starting to rise on the pipe as it begins to shift in color. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I said that we needed to cool it down with a pipe warmer. So the more heats you take, the further up that heat travels. just a team of people so Chris is shielding her with a cherry wood paddle right now just to make sure that she doesn't heat up too much now with a piece this size it does radiate its own heat and that's why she's also wearing a sleeve that's also made of Kevlar to try to protect some of that heat but her hands don't have any Kevlar on them so Chris's main job right now is just to make sure that she doesn't get any anything too hot or too comfortable for her to be able to work. And also just by angling the pipe downwards, it allows her to really get in there and we want there to be a nice, uh, a nice gradual slope to that jack line rather than a harsh one or else that would be pretty hard to break off and could risk it uh, cracking. Uh, in an undesirable manner. She's just using a hot torch right now. So this hot torch runs on natural gas and oxygen, and it creates a bit more of a force direct heat than that fluffier torch that you've seen her using. So that fluffier torch only runs on uh, propane or natural gas. And with this other one, it just allows for uh, more direct heat and for us to heat up things quicker. So in the reheating chamber, it heats up everything. And when we want to make a specific area warmer than the rest, we use tools like these. Does anyone have any questions? No? Just stunned by Kat, I understand. So she's just pulled in that pad of newspaper to try to cool down that tip. We don't want it to blow out too thin or else that could be a breaking point. So he's just taking a quick couple of what we call flashes to bring the whole body of this piece up to a higher heat as well. It doesn't really need to be super movable, but it should be above 1,000 degrees. 1,000 degrees is cold for us here in the glass studio, so we want to make sure the entire piece is above that temperature at all times. So she's just given a little extra heat to the back, but we are reaching towards the end of making of this piece. And it's pretty large right now. So three, four gathers of glass blown out, and that will probably still be a very thick piece and probably is very heavy to hold. 
and I can see Chris over there getting all suited up to put this in the kiln. So he'll put on a hoodie and some Kevlar gloves and possibly a face shield as well. It gets kind of warm when you go into these annealers. So this piece will probably take about eight to 12 hours to fully come down to room temperature. We don't want to leave this outside of any of these properly heated environments or else it will crack immediately because it can't handle that drastic of temperature drops that quickly. So that kiln over there has been sitting at about 9, 10 all day, and then we'll run it through that proper cycle to bring it down to the correct temperature over those courses of hours. I got the other side, G. All right, so this is going to be the last flash. I just heard her say it. So this is gonna be where they crack off the piece. You can see Chris over there is heating up those Kevlar gloves. We wanna make sure they're a little bit warm before grabbing this hot piece. And Kat's just gonna use a scoring tool to make sure that jack line cracks where she wants it to. So a little bit of water and a metal tool, and she just runs it completely around the form. And then she'll use her tweezers as well to add specific drops of water, and then she'll just tap it free. And then we'll do what's called a fire polish to make sure that there's no sharp edges on that jack line right there. So Chris is just getting ready to make sure that he can grab it and then tap and that's free. Can we get a round of applause? Yeah! All right, and a quick little fire polish and into the kiln it goes to be seen tomorrow. All right, let's hear it one more time for Kat Burns and the wonderful assistants. Yes. All right, well, thank you all for coming to the in-person show. Feel free to come forward, ask any questions you like, get a closer look at anything. And thanks for everyone who tuned into the live stream as well.